Glory to God. It's good to see everybody today. I apologize that we're not able to be live in service together, but I hope that you are going to enjoy being in the Word today. Welcome to New Life. And today we want to just go into prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon our time in His Word. And we want to ask the Lord to minister His anointing and His power as we go into His Word together. Can we pray? We want to pray for God to continue to minister to those who are volunteering at Hills Alive and that God would minister your, his strength to them, keep them refreshed. It's very hot out there, but they are making, uh, uh, they're being very effective, should I say, at uh, being a light in the community and, uh, and making everyone aware that New Life Tabernacle is the church that is stepping out and, and being everything that God's called them to be. So today I want to pray that the Lord would bless that. Pray that God would minister. If you would like to give, you can go down our Facebook page. There's Givelify link that's in our Facebook page. And we would, if you're a regular giver to the ministry of New Life, you can do so there. And we thank you for that. Can we pray? We ask the Lord that he would minister right now, God, that you would touch, that you would minister to those who are down at Hills Alive. Give them strength in the name of Jesus anoint them and lift them up and let your power be upon them. We ask that your blessings be with them, God, that you would just be merciful in that situation, Lord. Let there be divine appointments, Lord. We ask that you administer your anointing, your power, and your glory, and that you be upon your people today to help us to be everything that you called us to be. We love you and we thank you. We pray, Lord, your anointing be with us as we go into your word. Pray, God, against every spirit that's contrary to yours. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you administer your will. We come against every spirit that's contrary to yours. We rebuke it in Jesus' name. Command it to be subdued. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would arise, Lord. And we open our hearts to you to let your word have its way. We thank you and we praise you. And everybody says in Jesus' name, you might be at home, you might be in your car but we can still pray together in Jesus' name. Well, today I want to talk to you about a subject that's been on my heart for years. Um, and uh, it's something that it's not new to my ministry. I have ministered uh, in topics surrounding this subject be before, but I want to I just feel like it's time to talk about it today. I want to talk about the real dilemma Believers have an interesting quandary that they have to deal with when it comes to the scriptures. They have to believe what God says, and what God says is true. And if you truly believe that the God of the word brought forth his word, and that his word is uh, able to minister to our hearts, and that is forever settled in our hearts, then we have to believe that his word is going to have its way. And as a believer, we must, as believers... We must come to a place where we identify with the truths of his word, that we don't turn his truths to, to our benefit, but we, we make sure that we align according to the truths of his word. If we disagree with something that's in God's word, we're disagreeing with the author of the word. If we decide to change it, we're changing what the author of the word has put forth. And so today we want to go into his word and ask, uh, what is it that, God, that you're asking me in your word that I may be uh, distorting rather than aligning to? John 17 and 17, Jesus was praying before in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he, he, uh, he prayed this prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If you're a believer, you believe the word for what it says, and you trust God in his word. John 4 and 24 said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So understanding that in our in, in spirit and truth, we are a people that are uh, peculiar in the way that when God says it, we believe it, and it's final. It may be an issue of God's timing when we are trusting his word on how he comes through. But in reality, we still trust him for what he says. His word is always true. He cannot lie. How can the God who says he cannot lie, lie in his word? 
So we have to negotiate what it is that we are looking at and make sure that we are not going contrary to what God is saying in his word and figure out why we are looking at things a different way than God intended. Second Timothy actually, it prophesied of this time period. It says in Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, This know also that in the last days perilous or dangerous times will come, for men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, they're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness. They look godly. They say they go to church. They say they're a believer, but they deny the power thereof. I'm not saying anything different than what's in the Bible. I am reading the scriptures as they are written. He says on those, those types of people in the last days, from such turn away. So there's a warning that God's telling us. And the warning that we have from today's belief systems and today's mindsets, we have to be careful because we're in a, uh, a generation of, of even believers or unbelievers, but we know that already, but of believers that are declining from the word of God. There, there, there's a, a group that is taking the blood of Jesus out of the teaching of the scripture. They're teaching that there is no virgin birth or was no virgin birth, teaching that you should worship Jesus's mother, who was just flesh, but they make her divine, declining to tell children in school the truth of God and teaching them fables, calling it science, and making them feel less than who they are. Another thing that people try to say is that all you have to do is just believe in God. Wouldn't that be so simple? But if you're going to believe in God, you've got to believe what he says. And what he says will stand. It's what he says that, that we move forward with or we decline. John 7, 38 and 39, he said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then he declares what that is. Verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, that they which believe on him, talking to believers, should receive. So if you're a believer, you should receive the Spirit of God. It says, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet, is not, was not yet glorified. We're also in a, in a generation that is no longer identifying with the name of Jesus. Oh, sure, they do it in the passive things, but they won't do it in the important things. But Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We're, we're in a world that uses his name as a cuss word and gets away with it. But if you, if you use it to help someone that's in danger, you're, 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 in, you're in danger of forcing religion. You go into the colleges, you can't even talk about it. It's one of those things that you get marked for. You can't say Jesus. Now, you can go into certain places and say certain things, but you can't, you can't say Jesus in an education system. You are, you're pushing religion. We're in a time period of, uh, of people that will not go to church that proclaim something with, from the word of God that conflicts with their belief system and yet they call themselves Christians. Remember 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. There are some that call themselves of the faith and sound good, but when you share with them the good news of the word, they want to explain it away so that you are confronted, uh, so that you're conformed to their beliefs rather than what saith the Lord. New life, here at this church, 
We want to know what God says. We want to know what the Lord is saying. Our opinions do not matter when it comes to God's word. We're also in a church generation that says doctrine doesn't matter and wants to make the word of God politically correct. But God is not confined by man's thinking, and it never has been. Romans 16 and 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. I think God's word's pretty straightforward. He is very serious about people going against what he has proclaimed, trying to proclaim their own truth. And God is not impressed by our own truth. That's why in 1 Timothy 4 and 16 and verse uh, chapter 5, it runs into chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, the teaching. Look at yourself, look into yourself, and look at the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this you shall save both thyself and and them that hear you. What good would it be to spend my whole life trying to teach what's politically correct and never touching the heart of someone else with something that can set them free? Acts 13 and 12. Then the deputy, when he had saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Titus 2 and 10, that they shall adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Doctrine is important. Our opinion does not matter. In the last 50 years, it has shifted, especially in the last 10. The society is shifting to the norms of whatever goes. Whatever's the new thing that offends somebody is the new thing. Whatever it is that, that people want to believe, I guess they can just believe what they want to believe and they can all be saved and there's no one way to heaven. There's no one way to do God's will. You can make whatever God you want and you can serve whatever God you want and you will be fine. But I know that my, my God has brought forth his word. It's forever settled in heaven. And he says, we are to adorn the doctrine of God, our savior in all things. The teaching of God stands strong. That's why the familiar scripture of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That means that God's word has to have the ability to correct us, to reprove us, and instruct us. It says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. No wonder Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and 1. He gives Timothy a charge. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Boy, we don't have very many Timothys these, these days. People have the, the benefit of walking into a church and when something is said directly out of the word of God in the spirit of love, and they hear it and it, I just don't agree with that. I'm just going to have to move on. It's okay if you're talking about sound, sound doctrine. But when the word of God comes forth and it says what it says, we've got to be careful to make sure that we, we balance things against the word of God. And, and, our, and if our thinking is wrong, we need to correct the way that we think. It says that, Timothy could do these things. I know that there are pastors getting kicked out of their churches just for making someone feel uncomfortable. But we, we can't be that way. We need someone that can actually preach the word of God to us. And if we need to be rebuked, if we need to be reproven, then we need to be willing to allow ourselves to be in that position. It says this, to, he tells Timothy, for the time will come, verse three, that they went, that that they will not endure sound doctrine. They're teaching, they're not going to endure sound teaching. Teaching that makes complete sense. But after their own lusts, in other words, they want to hear what they want to hear. After their own lusts, they shall heap unto themselves teachers 
having itching ears, not the teachers. It's old English. In other words, they are itching to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear something that makes them feel good rather than something that will save them. An interesting a thought in, behind this is if they are being touched by the word of God and it saves them, then the thing that saves them will become the thing they want to hear. They shall be, they shall, verse four, turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I don't want to believe a fable. I want to believe the truth of God's word. Here's what today's English version says in that version, in that, in that passage in verses three and four. The time will come when people will not listen to sound doctrine, but will follow their own desires. It's about their desire, not about the truth. And will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will tell them what they are itching to hear. They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends. That's interesting that he uses the word legends. We've got people today doing televangelism and people are sent, they're just dumping money out to these, these people that will never know them, that will never directly love them, that will never directly influence their life. And when they become frustrated in the faith and their family's falling apart and they lose their job and things are going horrible, they will have no one that they can talk to that truly is connected. I thank God for the local church for that. You know, we, we are so, we've got to be careful because God is trying to reach our world as he always has. We've got to be careful to make sure that we are connected to the body. Second Peter chapter 1, 18 through 21. And this voice came from heaven, we heard, when we were with him in the holy mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed, as unto light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, until the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. How many times I have sat with people in Bible studies or had conversations with people and say, well, that's, I don't, that's just how you interpret it. I don't interpret it that way. I'm sorry, you're using a word that God despises. If we all, if we've used it, shame on us. We need to get, we need to get changed to use the words that God identifies with. He says his word is of no private interpretation. So that means that we need to look at the word of God in a balanced way as a believer to make sure we're connecting with the word of God to make sure that what we are reading is actually what it says. I have sat down in Bible studies where I've said, what does the word of God say right there? Well, the word of God says this. What do you believe? Well, I believe this. But what did you just read in the word of God? Well, I read that this, but I, I just don't believe that. Okay. What good have you just done to take the very book that's designed to give you divine direction and you still believe only what you want to believe? He says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In the place of worship that we have, maybe you gather, you don't come to New Life and you gather at another church, or if you come to New Life, the place of worship that you're in, is it based on man's doctrine or God's doctrine? Remember, we're supposed to adorn ourselves in the doctrine. In Mark chapter 7, verses 6 to 8, he answered and said to them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied to you hypocrites, or prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I don't speak as a new person in this. I grew up in just a religious understanding and church was something you went to and when you were done, you were out of there and you went home and you had some sincerity, but really it was about being seen at church and being a part of a church and you wanted to be connected. But I don't wanna honor God with my lips, but my heart is not connected. He said, how be it in vain they do worship me. When you have your heart disconnected, you're worshiping in vain. 
You have to find the place where your, where your worship matters by connecting your heart. What comes out of your mouth about God should be what's lived in your life. I don't want to be in this life a false advertisement for who I am. I'm not impressing God. I'm not impressing anyone. I may feel like I'm getting somewhere, but it doesn't matter. I need to make sure that I am who God has called me to be. He says, for the lying, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men and the washing of pots and cups and many other such things which you do. And he's, he's talking to this generation that, yeah, they, they have church. They have, they have the, the gathering place and they do all these things out of tradition, but is it backed up by the truth of God's word? But I serve the God of Hebrews chapter 13, 8 and 9. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says after that, he says, be not carried about with divers or different and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats for which ye have profited them that have occupied therein. So we come to John chapter 18, verses 37 and 38. He's, Jesus is is standing before Pilate. Pilate said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So if Jesus said it, I believe it. He says in verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate was standing feet away from Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, what is truth? I wonder how many people look into the word of God and say they're in truth, but they're so close and yet still ask, what is truth? And yet he's trying to reveal himself in them all the time. Remember Jesus' prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. So what does the word say about it? John chapter three, verses three through seven is the account of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, top 50 of, of Israel of his day, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and saith unto him, or answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except, E-X-C-E-P-T, not A-C-C-E-P-T, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then, and then Jesus clarifies, you're talking about going a second time into your mother's womb and be born, but that's not what I'm talking about. He says, that which, a, which is born of flesh is flesh. In other words, that has already happened. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. So the second being born of water and spirit is like the first. When you were born as a, as a baby, there was water breaking. And when you came out, there was spirit. You had the cry of a baby that says there's life. And when you're born of spirit, you also have water and spirit involved in that birth. And then he says in verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. He's saying to Nicodemus, we, we, you lost your way. You lost your way in the Garden of Eden. When Adam sinned and, and, and entered into the life that would lead to death. And, and you know that there's a separation. He says, don't, don't marvel that I say you have to be born again. You know how many people just marvel? We need to make sure that we're connecting with the message rather than just marveling at the message. When Jesus was ascending, the angels came to the disciples and said, why are you standing here gazing into the heavens? In other words, you're amazed that he just ascended into heaven when you should be going to Jerusalem and you should be praying for the promise. You should be going and praying for the promise. 
Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus uh, in, the, in the Great Commission said, and Jesus spake unto them saying, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Baptizing them in one name that contains all three of those attributes of God. In another passage, when Luke talks about it, it says, then he opened up their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ that uh, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Then Mark gives his account. And this is where we get down to the dilemma. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said unto them, uh, he, believe, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So the dilemma of a believer is that they have to believe and be baptized. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, there's an opportunity that we would love to give you. To We would love to facilitate. I baptized many, many people. I don't even I don't even keep count of all the people that I've baptized during my ministry. It, it, it's it's one of those things that we don't say we baptize the third Sunday of every month or every quarter. We believe the biblical way of baptism when a person's ready to be born again of the water, to be baptized in Jesus name. We go wherever there is water because fulfilling God's will is our first mission here at New Life. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that would lead me to understand that we're in trouble if we're not doing both. Do you believe God or do you believe tradition? He says this in verse 17, and these shine, signs, sorry, I'm, I'm dry mouth right now, but these signs shall follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Are you a believer? They shall cast out devils. We don't run around trying to find devils to cast out, but when the time comes, we don't back down as a believer. Some people think that means we're running around trying to find devils to cast out. That's not what he's talking about. When you get confronted, you have the ability to use the power uh, and, and cast out that devil by the name of Jesus Christ, using that authority that God has given you. And he says, and they shall speak with new tongues. So this is a sign that follows them that believe that you shall speak with new tongues. Boy, that's not necessarily the most popular doctrine that's out there. That doesn't change the fact that it says that. Jesus told them, you shall, this is a sign that will follow people that believe. Are you a believer? Then you shall speak with new tongues. I'm telling you right now, God's word is true. At 19 years old, I didn't come to an apostolic church. I wasn't at New Life Church. I was in Germany. In fact, I was in the in the armed services. I was in the Air Force in Spangdalem, Germany. And I wasn't around people that I, I wasn't of the of the belief that I am today. I just was hungry for God. And there was these charismatic young people that were there and they said, Let's go have a prayer meeting. And I'm like, a prayer meeting? Huh? Okay. And we had a prayer meeting and there was there was prophecy. There was people speaking in tongues, and I'd never heard that before. I was just growing up in a church that was kind of more traditional. And so they said, hey, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Have you received the Holy Ghost? I said, well, I've uh, I've said the sinner's prayer. I mean, I love God. And they said, well, have you received the Holy Ghost? Have you spoken tongues? And I'm like, no, I can't say I have. 
But that doesn't mean it can't happen. Can you show me where it is in the word of God? They pulled out a few instances, said that we shall speak with new tongues. And I thought, well, if God said it, I believe it. And we went back into a, another room right, right, right beside that one. And they were praying me through to receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So at age 19, I prayed and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Most incredible experience of, of that of that time. And it still is incredible today. God still moves the way he did upon me 33, 34 years ago. I've lost count. But God still is, does those things. And it wasn't because I went to a certain name church. It's because I was hungry to see God's will being fulfilled. And it was awesome. So my question, the dilemma that we face is, if you say you're a believer and you truly believe God, why aren't you seeking the Lord for these things? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall speak with new tongues. These signs shall follow them that believe. I heard someone once talk to me and they said, well, I, I don't think that's for today. That went away with the, with the apostles. That is the biggest cop-out. I'm sorry if you believe that. It's the biggest cop-out. You know why? Because it's happening to thousands upon thousands upon thousands. It's happened to many. I, I, I could probably venture to say many hundreds of thousands of people since I came in and first spoke in tongues. It, you can't tell People that have spoken other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance that it's not for today. For us, that's a cop-out. That's that plain and simple. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost today. Just reach out in your home. Reach out in your car. Reach out in the church. And if the church doesn't like it, you can come to new life. We will pray with you and we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost today because these signs shall follow them that believe. God's word does not lie. I trust the God who saved my soul. I trust the one who went to Calvary. He does not lie. That word, these, these signs shall follow them that believe were, was Jesus himself. And once they did receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues on the day of Pentecost, he said, Peter said, this promise is to you, to your children, to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Is God still calling people today? Yes, he is. It's for everyone. Don't let the devil lie to you. He is afraid of you receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He is afraid of you having that power operating inside of you. Believe God for his word. Don't allow this to be a dilemma. Allow this to be a great opportunity to say, God, I may not understand everything that you're showing me, but I want to know more. Open up my spiritual understanding. Give me revelation beyond my time. Give me understanding of your word. Show me your ways. <clears throat> your ways are higher than mine. And I want to see what you have to say. Let me make sure I clarify. And I don't want to go much longer except for clarifying what happened after he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In Acts chapter two, it says, when the day of Pentecost, verse one, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This is a historical account. It is an account of what happened in the first church. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And then there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. It doesn't happen like that all the time anymore. It was a sign to them. But it says it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. In other words, the sign followed them that believed. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and, and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. 
Peter gets up to preach in verse 14. Peter standing up at the 11. I've heard somebody, somebody say, well, they spoke another tongue so all the languages can understand. That you don't know your scripture. The scripture says, Peter stood up in one voice without interpreters. He said, lifted up his voice and said to them, you men of Judea and ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose. They thought they were drunk on the, in, in, with new wine. But he says, they're not drunk like you think. But it is just the third hour of the day on the Jewish clock that's 9 a.m. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He prophesied this. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, here we are, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. In other words, the thing that you're seeing of them speaking in other tongues as the spirit gives the utterance, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And he preaches this incredible message that this Jesus that you crucified 40 days ago, the one you hung on a tree, you killed him. You put him on the cross. Literally, you cried, crucify him. And he gets to the end of his message and he says, therefore, verse 36 of chapter 2 of the book of Acts, Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 shows their hearts. Their hearts weren't like people today. Well, I just don't believe that. I just don't think that's necessary. No, their hearts were, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They knew that they crucified him. You see, I'm, I'm born, born just about 2,000 years after this time period. And the fact is, is I knew it was my sins that took him to the cross. He went to the cross for you and for me. And my sins led him to the cross. It was a sacrifice that he made, his blood being poured out. It still applies to me today. The same question they asked is the same question we all need to ask. What shall we do? Peter in verse 38 said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the same gift we just got, you will get. Notice verse 38. Why is it so important? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and of spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's water. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's spirit. It's the fulfillment of the commandment. It's the fulfillment of the principle that Jesus had given to Nicodemus. And here's what happens. He says in verse 39, I quoted it earlier. And the promise, this promise of the Holy Ghost is for you to your children, which is the next generation, to all that are far off, we cover the globe. The gospel covers the entire world as even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He's still calling. He's still calling us. And he says in verse 40, he says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. I thought it was Jesus that saved us. Yeah, it is Jesus that saves us, but he's not going to arm twist us. We have to first make the step of committing ourselves to being saved. We have to say, Lord, I can't make it without you anymore. I repent of my sins. And then we fulfill his will by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And then he does his part. He fills us with the Holy Ghost. He's the only one that can do that. You go to some church teaching you tongues 101, you're in the wrong church. It's by the inspiration of God. It's by God giving the utterance. And it says this, and with other words, he said, he said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And verse 41, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. Immediate, immediate, not this pause, not, oh yeah, I think about it. I'm going to go home and just think about it. Immediately they received his word were baptized. The same day were added unto them, not two, 
not 12, not 50, not even 100. The same day were added to them about, about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine 3,000 people saying, if your word says it, I believe it. I want to fulfill your word, God. I want to do your will, God. The story I would encourage you in for homework if you're not a part of new life and even if you need to brush up again. In Acts chapter 10, we find the man who's, who's Cornelius. And Cornelius is a sincere man. He gives to God always. He prays always. He gives much alms to the people. And it says that he feared God with all of his house. In other words, he's what we would call a Christian nowadays. But an angel shows up and says, Cornelius, you need to go find this man named Peter, and he'll tell you what you need to do. And when he finally meets up with Peter around verse 44, he says, we're all here and we're present and we're ready to hear what God has commanded you to tell us. And while Peter is preaching, the Holy Ghost comes upon them and they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. God confirming that these signs shall follow them that believe. It's not that Cornelius was short of everything. Cornelius was very hungry, but God had to put him in the right place at the right time. And then in Acts 19, Acts 19, Paul coming down to Ephesus, he finds John's disciples and he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost. And he said, unto what then were you baptized? Notice how there's a, a theme, water and spirit, water and spirit. He goes from finding out if they've been filled with the spirit to well, then have they been baptized? They said unto John's baptism. It's Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7, I believe. And he says, he said, uh, he said, John baptized with this type of baptism, preparing for when Jesus would be here. And, uh, and he says, he's, and he says, upon hearing the words of what Paul was telling him, they said, well, we need to be rebaptized. And he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, we can facilitate that. It's, it's so important to do God's will. And then he says, he laid their, his hands on them and they spoke with other tongues. What more do we need than to know that God's word has not changed and we trust his word? I want to close with the passage from Revelations 21 and 1. I saw a new heaven, a new earth, the first heaven and the, and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea, no more earth day, I guess I could just say, not worshiping mother earth. God's the creator of the earth. There is no mother earth. It's God who is the creator of all things. He says, John, I, John, saw a holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride for, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, and sorcerers, verse 8, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. And I tell you today, you don't have to face the second death. You have an opportunity. If you're thirsty for the things of God, God will fill you. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. God wants to fill you with his spirit. Seek him today. Seek him today. Don't let this be a dilemma if you're a believer. Let this be an answer for you. God, there's more. 
There's something inside your heart that's crying out for more. God, there's got to be more than this. God, there's something more than this. And I want to tell you, you're right. There is more. And God has incredible things that he wants to touch you in your life with. And he's waiting for you to say, God, I'm hungry for you. If you need to learn more about the word of God, I would love to teach you a Bible study. Please, please message us on Facebook. It doesn't matter where you're at, even in the Black Hills. I'll come, I'll teach you a Bible study. There's nothing like the word of God. There's nothing like the people of God. Today, I encourage you, don't let the dilemma stop you. Let there be an answer because God's word is true and it's forever settled. God, I thank you, Lord, for those that are watching today. I pray, Lord, that this would be an answer to people's dilemma, Lord, that there would be a, a, something that would spark within them to realize that you truly are trying to call them to greater heights. God, that there would be something that would happen inside of every one of us, Lord, as we hunger and thirst for you, that there would be a revelatory anointing upon our hearts and our minds. God, I pray, Lord, that there would be a position, we would be in a position, Lord, if we have never spoken in other tongues, God, as the Spirit gives the utterance. God, if that's never happened, I pray, Lord, as believers, Lord, that we would pursue you into the promises that you have given because you're still calling us. And I pray the baptism of your spirit would come upon those that reach out to you, Lord, with true hunger, that you administer your glory, that you would fill to the uttermost, Lord, that you would overflow in their lives, and that the spirit of truth would go forth in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We thank you and we praise you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. God bless you. So glad you've been with, with me today. I pray you have a wonderful week. In Jesus' name.